Hi, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining our first international webinar catered towards logistics and operations and getting a container farm up and running in countries outside of the US. Uh, looks like we have people joining from all over the world. We have Angola, Barbados, I saw Germany, Israel, Fiji, Jamaica. It's gonna be a great 30 minutes talking to you guys. Um, my name is Rick Trenchard. I lead the business development team here at Freight Farms, and I've been with the company for a little over five years. When I first joined back in 2016, we were in four countries outside of the United States, and we're now in 35 countries in, and in every continent except for South America. Uh, today, our international community amounts to about 35% of our total customer base, and it's also our fastest growing segment. A lot of our international customers are capitalizing on some exciting business opportunities while also addressing serious social and food and security issues. Um, especially our customers in island nations and remote parts of the world that have very little to no arable land to have a self-sufficient agriculture industry. Um, I'm joined today with my friend and colleague, Harry Reitemaker, the CEO and co-founder of Food to Farms in Homstead, Sweden. He's one of our first international partners that helped us expand to Scandinavia and elsewhere in Europe. I like to joke that he was the first one up the hill and took all the arrows, so the rest of us don't have to. <laughs> um, he's going to be a great resource for us today. We have people joining in from 80 different countries, so we're not going to address everyone's local regulation and customs. But Harry can talk about his experience in getting systems up and running in Sweden and in the e EU that can hopefully translate to the rest of us in our own countries. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the mic to Harry to introduce himself. Thanks, uh, Rick. Uh, glad to see everybody. Uh, yes, it's been an adventure. I mean, we uh, founded uh, Food to Farm, uh, Future of Farming, the company here in Sweden uh, back in 2016. Uh, that, that must have been about the time you joined the company too, Rick, right? Yep, that's right. Um, our, 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 our purpose was to, I mean, my background is uh, marketing advertising. Uh, I met my old friend uh, here in my local town and we said, let's do something we've never done before. And we started to look at the food industry as something that we have not really worked so, so long and hard with. Um, and we saw that a lot of our, uh, and anyway, the way the food is, uh, imported to Sweden, a lot of the food comes a long way. And we especially looked at the fruits and greens. And at the same period, when we started to look at that, uh, I got a, an email from a friend with a, showing a couple of guys walking into a container, growing fresh lettuce. And I was like, that's the future. I showed it to my partner and he would say, okay, let's contact freight farms. And then since 2017, we started to work together and it's been nothing but a really adventurous, uh, uh, adventurous since, since that day. Now, uh, at the moment, we have launched farms in Norway, Sweden, uh, helped out with the freight farms customers in, for example, Estonia. Uh, we also have customers in, in Germany. So by this point, we also had, you know, aggregated a lot of uh, uh, knowledge in what it takes to bring a farm over here from overseas. Um, we are in EU, we are specialized in the EU questions. Uh, it's all about, I mean, Freight France makes a really good job in, in making and uh, building these farms, and especially the international farms, which will actually work everywhere. What is important for each and everyone out there is to know the local uh, rules and regulation and laws, how, how this technique technology can work on your market. Let, let, let's start there, Harry. I, I know when I talk to people um, overseas, the biggest question that comes up is, is what is the delivery? And what, is, what does it take to import this farm to my country? What are the custom fees? Do I need a broker? How does, how does that work? And from your experience in working with freight farms, what did you need to do? What do you recommend people do before moving forward with an order as far as getting the importations, uh, documentations in a row? Well, as, as 
for import, you uh, as for you as an importer, it's important to know, uh, for example, what is the import code of, of a container farm. Now, for different countries, this taxation is might be different. Uh, in Europe, it's one percent, one point seven percent, on top of the, uh, and that sum is based on uh, the invoice that you are being billed by freight farms for your farm. And this is something that if you if you have a if you let freight farms do the transport or if you do your own organize your own transport with a skipper, this is you put that responsibility in their hands so that they will take care of all customs declaration and also they will bill you for the for these customs fees. Um, were there any um, were there any tax breaks or incentives because the equipment was was deemed agriculture or is that not not something that they do in Sweden? Uh, I mean the the one point seven percent is for the whole of EU. So I was actually not directly involved in take in this classification of the customs code, but I guess this customs code the customs system is worldwide. So. If you get the customs code for freight farms, you can check locally what does that mean on your market? Right. How much is the local tax? But for EU, it's 1.7% on top that you will have to pay. And, and then, so once you figure that, that process out and then we get the farm to your port or your harbor, what, what is the next step? Do you usually hire a local crane company? Would you work with like a flatbed truck? What, what do you do logistically to get the farm from the port to the... Yeah, well, if, if we start in the other end where the farm, when the farm leaves freight farms or your production facility, it is important to know for you as a client that this farm is yours. So you will have to have it insured through your broker or if you organize this shipping yourself, just to make sure the farm is insured before it goes on board on a ship. I mean, for, for a farm to, to get over to here to Europe, it takes about three weeks before we have it in our production facility. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's important that you have this seamless uh, looking into, does the insurance cover me all the way? Freight France has, of course, a warranty, but the warranty is something else. This is a one-year warranty on your farm. Uh, but when it comes to insurance, it's just make sure it is uh, insured. Now, once the farm comes to us, uh, let's say the farm arrives here in Sweden, uh, we make sure that uh, we'll have, or actually when it comes to us, we already have it. Uh, we have the truck waiting for the farm. We have a loading, loading of the farm onto the truck, transported to our production facility. There's another uh, crane waiting for it, lift it off and place it on the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, we start to work with the harmonization of, right. for, for, for EU and the CE marking. Now, when it comes to any other location, this is something that you can take care of yourself or you can ask your international shipper to help you get this, uh, uh, the right type of uh, crane to lift this farm. Uh, onto your truck, and then you have to have another truck to lift it onto your location. Right. And before, and the, the most important work is actually to have the site prepared. And I know that Freight Trumps has some really good documents in describing how the how the site installation site should be. That was actually going to be my next question, because once you have the logistics of the shipping sorted out, um, and you know you've worked you've worked in multiple places in Sweden, Norway, Germany. What are some due diligence that customers should do before choosing their site? Did you have to talk to local uh, city officials or were there certain zoning things that you had to do? Yeah, it depends. I mean, in Sweden, we have quite a lot of regulations around building permits and stuff. So it depends on, we have two types of customers. We have the, we have the, the food stores who, who would love the idea to place a farm next to their food store and then start produce it. Now, this is in an area where you normally have to have a building permit. Uh, same for example, uh, an entrepreneur who wants to, to do, uh, we have several entrepreneurs who do uh, corporations with real estate companies. 
here the real estate company can help you find a good place on their real estate on, on their grounds and they can also help you with the building permit so it's all about getting yourself organized and getting more people on board your project so you get can get allies to make this project happen right especially right. especially important if you're an entrepreneur because you you, you it's it's actually quite stupid to try to do this all by yourself. Yeah. You need to talk to your local community, your local government, and your local real estate company that can help you find a good location. Try to figure out a location where you also have other traffic generators. So there's a lot of people around that can actually buy your produce. And, um, it's easily, it's, visibility is also important that people can come and visit your farm and see sure. it. And, talk to you as a farmer for sure for sure um for the for folks who are just tuning in um there's a panel on the right side of this webinar where you can ask questions so we're going to wrap this up in 10 minutes and then do 10 minutes of q a um so harry I, I think we covered one of the biggest questions we get which is the importation of the farm and things to look out for and you you brought up a good point with insurance um having a local custom broker and also working with like local city officials and the community to find a location of the farm. Is, is there any other tidbits that you have as far as the logistics of bringing a farm across the Atlantic Ocean um, <clears throat> before we jump into other topics? Well, we, we talked to a lot of different potential farmers about their potential ideas of, of buying a farm like this. There, there will be no problem starting farming in a farm like this in any climate, basically. The problem is to make your business model profitable, you have to work on your business model. Who's gonna buy your crops? This is the most, and we spend a lot of time with our customers discussing how they build their business model because we don't wanna sell farms to, to, to an entrepreneur who, who we know we already see on the business model. This is probably not gonna, gonna work. So we, we and it could take anything from two to three months to, to break the right, to make them work in the right way and think in the right way to be able to sell the crops at, at the highest price. Right. Because the yields will be there. And the worst thing you can have is, I mean, turning a machine on like this is like basically printing your own money. But the, 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 the crops is your capital. You have to sell it to the, to the, in, in the best way to make your project work. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. And we we had the, um, for, I think some people here joined our webinar last week where we we talked about the business case and how important it is to to have that set up before you move forward. Um, just my last question about when you're working with like city officials or even when you're working with um, an insurance company or a skipper or anyone at customs, do have you ran into any snags where people just didn't understand the technology so they didn't know how to classify it is is that an issue or or is it pretty straightforward to tell people what this <clears throat> i think in in the beginning i mean let's back down five years ago it was more like okay it's a container farm what is that it's more like a, right. a very new thing but as at least in europe as we see more of these farms pop up in in different versions I mean, especially the really, really big farms that can deliver a lot of crops. Uh, this technology has become more of a, something that is almost something that your local community has to have to, to, to be able to, to provide really good fresh crops. I mean, there's no meaning. I mean, in Sweden, every... 50% of all the greens we eat, we import from Spain. I mean. That's a, that's a 2,000 kilometer trip. Right. And you can grow it 60 meters from your food store. Right. It's like, it's an easy, easy equation. So it's more about talking to your potential business partners, as we say, for the local entrepreneurs and, and selling the possibility of having a lot of farmable land right next to your food store or to your restaurant or to your hotel or in, in your local community. Right. At, uh, and that also produces all year round. That's fantastic. Right. right. And I, I'm already seeing a lot of questions coming in about the economics of the farm, which we should dive in when we get to the Q&A part. 
Um, but one question we get quite often is, you know, we, where our headquarters, our client services team is based in the Northeast of the U.S. We're based here in Boston. Um, what, what has the, the support been like for you being, you know, across the pond in Sweden? And, and how has that worked for you and, and other customers in Europe from the support angle? I think the support is great. I mean, the, the way, especially with pharma, I mean, we are also far away from our customers to some extent. Uh, I mean, I take up the north in Umeå, for example, they are, if I start to drive now, I'm going to be there in 13 hours. I mean, I just don't pop by and, and check on their farms. And we have two farms here in the local town, one by a big supermarket and by one who's by an entrepreneur. There's much easier. I can go by, I can talk to them. We can see how, how we can do service and support on location. But farming is really, we do 95% of all support via, uh, via farmhand. And we can see the farm and we can help the farmer if they forget to put an outlet on or if they forgot to put the main pump on. Or so. and, and, and if we can fix it, freight farms is like, it's, it's actually only an email and then, then support will dock in and they can see the farm and they can help yeah. with local issues. I, I like to look at our, our team here almost as like a tier two support because the farmhand really is a tool to, to address most things that could go wrong. There's also that knowledge base, which is a bunch of documentation of how to troubleshoot. But yeah. we, we currently we're nine to five East Coast time. So usually there's nothing too drastic that can't wait a couple hours. Um, but farmhand is a good tool. And yeah. similar to that, it's how do you deal with um, supplies? So this is another question I get all the time. Is like, you know, if you're in Singapore, if you're in Bahrain or wherever you are, you know, we, we in the U here in the US, we have a, a farmhand shop where people can subscribe and get their consumables, but we don't have that offering everywhere in the world. So in Sweden, how, how do you go about getting supplies for the farm? Well, we, we started actually to produce uh, bulk uh, of the nutrients, pH down and the grow plugs, the basics basically. And we also produce microbes. Uh, so we have that in stock in our warehouse and we use uh, local European suppliers to do that who are all, normally work with much bigger greenhouses than, than uh, a container farm. Mm -hmm. So we, um, that's how we sold because it's, it, it is also, uh, how should I say, some of the stuff you can't import from the US to Europe, for example, it's not, it's not allowed. Uh, seed, seeds are is something that you should source locally. There are a bunch of good source uh, seed companies uh, spread across Europe. We have some really good Swedish companies. Uh, within the European Union, for those of you who are not in EU, we have a free market, so product produce can products can uh, move freely, mm -hmm. which is simple. Right. But if you are on a more re remote location, um, even in Europe, I mean, we we often help. We often, even if it's not our customer, so let's say the farm has been sold directly. Uh, by freight farms. We help out the local farmer here in, in Europe with support and uh, supplies if they want to. Right. So, uh, so we actually have some, some farmers we work with who are uh, bit about, we work, we help out uh, uh, Alexander who is, has a farm in Beirut in Lebanon. Yeah. They are working under very tough conditions mm -hmm. to get the farm up and running every year. We're working with Estonia. We are working with uh, Germany, which is our client. And um, yeah, so, so it's all depending on where you are. Right, right. It, it, that's so true. And one, one thing I like to say, just to ease any stress is, you know, we didn't invent hydroponics. So there's a huge hydroponic industry in most places, um, yeah. unless you're in a very remote area. And if that's the case, I'm sure you can find something to where you can import it. We've also worked with clients where um, sometimes it makes sense for us to send them a year worth of supply at once to save on uh, shipping costs, but there's certain things we can't ship like seeds and, and yeah. um, couple What more to look at, when it comes to shipping, COVID has not been nice to, to shipping. I mean, our route has so far been, is quite okay. Prices has, has gone up. So I think it's very, before you decide, you look into your shipping costs, what would it take to, to, to bring a, a container 
from uh, from US to your country. Okay. Uh, it has been a dramatic change in those prices and uh, should look into that. That's a very, very good point. And I'm sure there's gonna be questions about delivery costs. And what, one thing I would say is what we've experienced and you know, we're very much a, we're in, the, we're in the shipping container business. So this whole supply chain backlog has really affected our business. We've seen 500% increase in the cost of shipping to certain areas. And in certain areas, we haven't seen any increases. So I would say if, if people are interested in, in looking for a quote, ask, ask somebody at Freight Farms, we can get you something hopefully within 48 hours, but it has, it's very volatile right now. Um, yeah. Before we go into QA, one, one last question I have is, and you might not have like a concrete answer here, but in customers you worked with in Europe, how do most customers go about financing the equipment in your experience? Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, it's not likely that you have, uh, maybe you have the cash stuffed away somewhere and you just want to invest it in the farm. Uh, you're welcome to do that, of course. Uh, we have set up a sort of a scheme where you can you can lease lease a farm. It's leasable, mm -hmm. at least here in Sweden. Uh, you can talk to your local bank. To, to under, it's like any business you want to start. Talk to your bank, see what, uh, and explain to right. them this is what I'm trying to do. Present your business model to them. Your, your business case, and I'm sure they will be able to, I mean, right now there's a lot of money available on the market. And if you have a really good business model, I'm sure the bank's gonna say, yes, we'll help you, we'll support sure. you. If I, it comes to the, uh, it's like, a, like a supermarket, big food store, they normally buy their farm. Right. And they invest in it right. and it's, yeah. Yeah, and it all starts with that business model, like you mentioned. Um, yeah. Questions are pouring in, Harry. So I want to make sure I answer some of these that they have. Um, also, we want to do a quick poll. Um, I think there's going to be a poll that's going to pop up to ask where people are in their in their project planning phases. So if you can take a second to, to answer that, that would be helpful. Um, one question that we just got is, and this might probably be a good one for you, Harry, because you you not only work with customers, but you spent a good amount of time in the farm. I you think you're, you're, I would consider you a, a farming expert as far as like the day-to-day -day operations go. Yeah. What is, what is a profile or experience needed for someone to be a farmer? Uh, you have to be a MacGyver problem solver sometime. You have to be a little bit interested as a lot of people are interested in the farming part but you have to have a certain interest because this is an internet of thing product. This is a bit, this food tech. It's the meat. This is where food production and technology meets. So you cannot only be interested in the food part and skip the technology because then you, you're going to run into some problems and okay. we will help you. No problem. We will teach you the tech, but if you're not interested, I think that's a, you sh shouldn't touch it. It's yeah. not, it's not, I mean, there's only, from all the farmers I've trained, uh, and as we, we, we conduct farm camp. And this is a two day, a two day uh, experience where you will learn anything about the farm, how to calibrate sensors, how the technology works. Of all the people, and I think I trained about 60 people right now in, in total. I think there's one with experience of farming. And right now all these farms, but they had a little bit of technology interest and the, and the total technology is not super, uh, how do you say, difficult. Just you have to have an interest, understand the machine. Yeah. Then you will be successful farmer. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. If I, if I look at, um... The farmers who are who I think are the most successful, they do have two things in common. One is they're interested in the tech and they're interested in how food grows. So they are DIYers and problem solvers. Um, I think with enhancements of the technology, not much is needed in that regard, but just having the interest is important. The second thing that makes a good farmer, in my opinion, is being a good salesperson. Because like you said, it's going to grow all this produce. 
People like yeah. the quality of the produce. Now, can you sell it? And can you demand the right price point for it? Yeah. That definitely is a big one. Um, to that regard, I've just got a question. And this one is, is more EU specific. What, what are the major crops that you produce uh, that are competitive compared to the normal production during a season, say summertime? And does it fluctuate in like profitability in the seasons? Well, the thing is when you, you have to meet the season, you have to go, for example, in, in, in the autumn here in Sweden, kale, green kale, black kale is available from farmers on free land. Now, then you don't grow kale, you grow something that they don't grow. So we, you have to constantly think opposite. So what, what is available on the, from the free land market or from other farmers? And because you can grow anything at any time. So you just have to think different. Right. This is, I think, this is the most. But most of the farmers, they grow any, depending a little bit who their clients is. We have farmers who are specializing in eatable flowers, special types of herbs, special, and they are catering to the sort of finer, fine dining restaurants. Uh, then you have the, 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 the food stores. They are doing lettuce, varieties of lettuce, kale, more what's more like the, the uh, starting with the seed, looking at how, how does this plant make my, uh, my department of food look smashing? So they right. actually curate, curate uh, uh, how to say, the, the, the varieties. So the, 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 the food area looks even better than it did before. Right. Um, what, is, what is a what is the best crop to grow in Sweden right now? You mean in the farms? Yeah. Oh, it's like they. I can't say what's. I mean, the, I would say fifty percent grows lettuce, but uh, there's a variety of kale that uh, has not been on this market before, and that people have suddenly gotten taste for, mm -hmm. like Ethiopian kale. We, we introduced Ethiopian kale a couple of years ago, and this kale has more like a garlic taste to it. And mm -hmm. now the uh, customers are coming back and asking the farmers, can you grow more of this kale? We want to buy a bunch of restaurants are very interested in new taste experiences. So I think the most exciting, this is not only a farm, this is a gastronomical box because it all starts with a seed. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can introduce new varieties on your market that you can get extra paid for. And that's the most important thing. Yeah, and, and this applies, I think, in, in almost any country. I can't think of a country where this wouldn't apply to. Because no. even in the U US, when, when we have customers talking to chefs, for instance, their biggest, their biggest selling point is that the chef is very limited to what their wholesaler has to offer. And the wholesaler yeah. is, is, only, is limited to what is available in you know, California, yeah. big agriculture. So, if you're going to introduce a crop that the wholesaler doesn't have, you automatically have it in with that chef. And you can also- yeah. do, uh, 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 It's uh, like, uh, like the, for example, the wasabi rucola. I mean, the chefs go crazy about that. And it's really, it, you, you can say wasabi rucola, does it really taste wasabi? Yes, it does. And you just, you take one leaf and you chop it up and put it on top of the salmon, put it in the oven. This is, it really pops in, in your mouth. Okay, we have two. We have two more minutes, so I want to get to yeah. a couple more questions. Um, how many people ideally would it need to to farm? Um, and the gentleman also asks, like, in addition, how many people to farm, but also sell and distribute the crops? In your experience, um, depends what your what your customer looks like. Do do you have to single singly patch each individual lettuce beautiful and deliver it in a in, in, a, in, a, in a bag, so like many do. And that is more maintenance than, for example, if you are a food store and you are just bringing the crops in, in, in gray in plastic bags in, in a gray crate, mm -hmm. because then it needs no pre-packaging, just display it and sell it. Right. If you, are, if you, if you do it next to your restaurant, it's uh, just bring it in. Right. Of course, we, do, we don't grow in earth, so you don't need to, you actually don't need to uh, rinse the plants. Right. There's no pesticides, there is no, nothing like that. So it's, um, 
Right. And it, yeah, it's hard it, to say, but I say, you say, if you want to run the farm, so you should have one person doing on the farming. I'm just talking on the farming now. To run a really good farm, you should spend 25 hours a week, right. one person. And you tell, take help on the days you want to far, harvest. Because right. it's easier if you're two to harvest. Right. I think I think so much of <clears> these uh, <throat> economical questions are based on what your what your market is, who you're gonna sell to, just yeah. the, the root of the business model. Um, we're just at time. One question someone asked is if they ordered now, when would they get the farm? Our current lead time for our, our, our normal domestic unit is is about five to six months. We do have inventory now, uh, very limited inventory for international models that are available for shipping immediately. Um, they're first come, first serve. Um, if you have any questions uh, that we didn't answer on this webinar, either reach out to somebody you're already talking to at Freight Farms or at Futu Farms, um, or reach out to hello at Freight Farms and someone should, should get back to you. Um, <clears throat> time we have today and harry thank you again for taking time out of your day to speak to these wonderful people um and yes take care this recording will be sent out soon okay great thanks everyone <laughs>